Well, hello and welcome to the Plant-Based Fat Loss Solution Series. My name is Tanya Y. Pritchett and I am your host for this series. Today, I am joined by my wonderful guest, Dr. Sam Shea. Hello, Dr. Shea. Hi, Tanya. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Um, how are you? Uh, good. I'm, I just, yesterday I was in the Boulder Comedy Festival as one of Wow. Uh, a great Exciting. lineup of comics. So yeah, <laughs> despite the academic veneer and all the nerdy stuff we're going to talk about today, I do stand up comedy as a hobby, but also as a vehicle for education. So I hope today will be not only educational, but also a bit entertaining as well. Well, wonderful. Yeah, I was gonna say, hope you can bring some humor into this very serious topic. Uh, just want to give you a formal introduction. So Dr. Sam Shea helps busy health conscious entrepreneurs and mompreneurs attain and sustain high performance so they can create more freedom for themselves and others. Dr. Shea has walked his own health journey from being chronically unwell from the ages of six through 18, including severe fatigue, anxiety, digestive problems, chronic pain, severe insomnia, and poor nutrition. He has dedicated his life to natural medicine to get himself and others well, which led him to functional medicine and functional testing to help fatigue, gut, weight, brain fog, and hormones. So I am so pleased again to have you here, Dr. Shea. And why don't we get started by letting um, everyone know how you got involved, obviously, from your, your youth and the unfortunate um, difficulties you had with your health and your youth. But give us a little bit more about how you got involved in diet and weight loss. Sure. So uh, the, it, it, it's really started my youth. And um, I'll just share. I'll just I, I love visuals. So I've got I made a special PowerPoint for your summit because summits are awesome. Uh, okay, so basically the, the intention, so the intention of this talk is to understand the hidden gaps of plant-based diets and why lab testing is a real necessity. And I got into weight loss through my personal journey and through labs. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was, and also why I focus on helping entrepreneurs, particularly mompreneurs. And of course I help other people, you know, who aren't entrepreneurs, but just, I, I focus there. And the reason why is I was raised by a very stressed out, unhealthy, burned out, tired mompreneur. Uh, my father was, you know, technically there for giving child support. And it was a very, very rough go from age six, from the, the nuclear divorce, um, and me and my sisters were caught in the black radius between uh, that, that divorce between my mother and father. And it created massive stress at home and compounded with a lot of uh, physical violence and verbal abuse at school. And there was no real place that felt truly safe. And so I developed two addictions, uh, one to video games, one to sugar, crippling, mind-numbing insomnia for 12 years to the point where it actually stunted my growth. Wow. And, uh, and I know it's sense in my growth because I have, I'm, f I'm barely five, six, yet I have a size 11 shoe and I have uh, very large hands and mm. my um, father's height is much taller. And according to the shoe charts, the average height, I should be at least four inches taller. And the muscle density that I have uh, is much denser than normally because I should have been stretched out another four inches or so. And wow. so uh, I also had terrible gut issues. Uh, even though both my parents are medical doctors, uh, in the eighties diet was, was not a thing that was really understood. So I had a really bad diet and just a whole host of gut issues, fatigue. Um, uh, as I had physical pain, lots of physical pain from, mm -hmm not only slouching at school in front of TV screens, video games and computers all day, but from the injuries from, from being assaulted at school that, and I've honest, I, I mean, I thought back pain was normal as like a 10 year old. I wow. just didn't know, like I, I just had just terrible back pain from being hit in the back really hard. And to this day, I have a, I have a ongoing scoliosis in my thoracic spine and occasionally it flares up. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it was a, it was an, it was, it was a bit of a drama. Uh, and I decided as a teenager to uh, take control of my own life. And my, it, it's a, 
it's a pretty long detailed story. If people are interested in knowing the full details of it, I've got other, you know, podcasts I list on my website if they want the full narrative journey, uh, how I came out of addiction, how I got out of, uh, you know, pain, how I ended my insomnia, how I dealt with the severe fatigue, the gut health and everything else. The encapsulation is that everything I learned from this multi-decade journey to recover my, my own health, I also engage with professionally in my career to help others because I have a very deep visceral connection to people who struggle with chronic problems that either no one understands or no one believes, mm -hmm. um, the latter being even more painful than the not under, being not, under, not understood. And uh, I help mompreneurs, uh, you know, and entrepreneurs, but the reason why I help mompreneurs is to pay it forward. And just full disclosure, my mother and I have a fantastic relationship. It took a couple decades of really meaningful, deep introspection and therapy and lots of work and also her being willing to meet me on the other end to have the difficult mm -hmm. conversations to reconcile. We've really reconciled. And That's I want to help mom. It's, it's very, it's, I mean, it's one of the proudest things I've ever done is reconcile mm -hmm. the relationship with her. And I want, you know, if you help mom in, as a general rule of thumb, if you help the mom of a family, you help the whole family. Uh, and it, it's no different than, you know, micro loans in other countries is that you give the money to the mom of the family. And that way you have a near guarantee that the kids will be educated as opposed to sometimes you give the money to the husband and, it, and there is a risk of it being gambled or drunk away depending on circumstance. So this is a similar type. I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to bring politics into this discussion, but it's just mm -hmm. a reality uh, on the ground uh, that if you help the mom, you help the family. And my mother did not get the help that she needed. When she was raising me, she did not have the support of a very compassionate, intelligent, skilled clinician to help her with her lifestyle so that she could navigate her meaningful issues that she had going on in her, in her emotions and also in her physical body. She was not also physically that well. And she made decisions on my behalf that were, by her admission, not the best because mm -hmm. she was busy coping. Yeah. You know, and, and that, so, and, and I, you know, as an adult, I get that. I get that. So now I'm paying it forward, but like, okay, how can I help any other parallel versions of me help mom? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's why I focus there. Um, and and I just, um, I don't want to cut you off, but I, I love that. And I love that um, the passion and, and that the acknowledgement and awareness that the moms oftentimes are the ones that, you know, they, they're mompreneurs. So they're, they're moms, but they're also either entrepreneurs or they're um, high, highly uh, successful business women. And they carry a lot of different buckets. And um, a lot of times they don't get that support and a lot of traditional medicine, it has its place. Um, but at the same time, unfortunately, a lot of um, doctors are easy and quick to just write a prescription and not really um, give the, the, the women or the men or whomever the time that they need to really find out what's going on with them. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and uh, this is one of the distinguishing factors of someone who is practicing in the functional medicine side of things is we spend mm -hmm. way more time and dig a lot deeper into, you know, root cause and then provide the support to help walk someone through the meaningful changes. And, and a really good clinician will first start with what is the easiest, simplest, quickest, change that can be done with the highest gains mm -hmm. so as to not because someone's already overwhelmed you, you don't want to give someone 300 health tips right <laughs> that, that, no <laughs> uh we give and and even doing it's, it's even interesting like in, when you look at lab testing sometimes like people really need to like the, the root issue is like over here but to, like for example someone's like really really toxic mm 
like mm-hmm. really like they have the liver side they have the liver stuff they have the heavy metals they have all whatever else is over there but to get to really deal with this do that first is can be really rough mm-hmm. really rough so to get someone feeling and getting healthier you may have to start with something like adrenals and gut health first so that they're more resilient and stronger and they're feeling better so that then this will be much easier, even though this may be the root thing of the whole issue. To jump here, it, it's going to be so uncomfortable they're not, it, that they're going to stop. So mm-hmm. even as a clinician doing sometimes the most, the most critical thing is not necessarily the first thing. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, that's part of the skill of being a good clinician is how can you make sure that someone can do a program without making their life feel worse? Yeah. You know, so, yeah, and and it, that's, that happens. Yeah, because yeah. then they're going to feel worse and then they're, they're going to want to stop. <laughs> and, and they're um, going to be demoralized. I mean, right. and then, then there's like this defeat. This like it, then it creates it's, it's a long term. It actually causes long term psychological damage. Like mm-hmm. it, it's, it's really important to make sure that people feel as reasonably good as is reasonably possible during the stages of their their healing process. So they don't you know, sometimes it's unavoidable when you mitigate and you adapt and you, you cal- calibrate along the way. But, but this is, uh, it, it's, I have had so much more. I used, I used to be like 10 years ago, I was like root cause at any cost. And I'm like, no, that was, that was a bit, that's a bit, it's uncompassionate. Mm-hmm. That, that's really, it's, it's really uncompassionate. Um, where, where, what were we talking about before? No, you were, you were uh, just talking about how sometimes you might have something here, but you have to figure out what's going on here first. No, no, no. Before, before that, we were talking about my the story, and then. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, just just to quickly um encapsulate. I got to, how I got to weight loss. That was it. So how did I get to weight loss and plant based diets and lab testing? So, uh, what I noticed was that um, a lot of people were coming to me with all sorts of these kind of this global, this gestalt of all sorts of issues like fatigue, low energy, weight gain, and um, brain fog and and sleep issues and lack of not having full functions of their decision making process and all the rest of it. And what I found was that uh, weight was a very common point of intersection, but weight can be caused by all sorts of things. It could be hormonal related, it could be gut related, it could be liver related, it could be mitochondria related, it can be inf- inflammation related, it can mm-hmm. be uh, all sorts of stuff. And um, what I found was that in my journeys and to get myself better, I discovered lab testing and uh, that a lot of people, weight is also something people can measure on themselves. And, and I, my, I would prefer people focus on body shape than actual weight itself because mm-hmm. the body shape is actually a more important metric of, of health and well-being than just gross weight. Uh, just for example, an, an NFL linebacker who's 300 pounds, 5'10", and you know, t- 9% body fat would technically have an, a BMI of over 30 or something, like, like technically, but that their body shape and their muscle mass is not indicating any obesity. Right. So- Um, I found that weight was something that was such an incredible intersection point for all the different possibilities that could be going on with someone physiologically, hormones, gut, mitochondria, et cetera, brain health, um, the neurotransmitters, amino acids, fatty acids, inflammation, all the things. And it was something that everyone could really, uh, align with and understand and, and, and have a personal metric to. So, uh, I got, I'm personally, I personally don't have a weight issue. I actually have the reverse issue that I burn weight too quickly. And some people may say, Oh, lucky you, aren't you svelte? (laughs) And I said, well, hold on. There's, there's consequences. So people like this, there's definite consequences. People have the, I have a metabolism of a bumblebee, you know, like (laughs) if, when I, when people who can put on a layer of fat, they actually have a buffer to control toxins and inflammation and blood sugar. Mm-hmm. They can throw that stuff into the fat cells, the, the dirty closets of the body. You know, you mm-hmm. just shove it in the dirty closet. And then at some point in the near decade, you may open the closet, 
all the dust flies out and you pull everything out and you've got enough mental capacity and room and resources to sort everything out, clean it out, then the closet's clean. That's the same thing with the fat cells. Fat cells are there, they're the dirty closets. Now, if I don't have any dirty closets available, when I eat something toxic or I get inflamed and my blood sugar goes awry, where does it go? My organs, my mm -hmm. nervous system, my brain, and, <laughs> and um, my, my uh, placking along my blood vessels. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, I get, and I'm at higher risk of insomnia, mood disorders, and neurodegeneration because I don't have a buffer of fat. Wow. So it's not, it, it's not, you know, lucky me, I'm svelte. Like, no, there's, there's meaningful trade-offs. So there's, there's, and that's based on my genetics. Mm -hmm. So but I'm affected and also pain. I get joint pain if I get too inflamed as opposed to swell up. So that's also where I got into genetics where people, um, if people are trying to figure out what their best diet is and also how to manage weight, genetics also plays a massive role in that. So you can actually now with today's science genetically determine, are you a keto, a paleo, a Mediterranean or a high carb person? And there are people who slant more towards the keto paleo side. They're genetically more appropriate to be uh, have higher protein fat diets mm -hmm. than those that are in the Mediterranean and higher carb pool. And that science is available today. I think that's, um, that's a great point to point out too that, and, and one of the things I wanted to emphasize with this too, is that even though, you know, this is called the plant-based fat loss series. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on board is because, um, people need to know that it's, and it's an option, but it's not the only option. And they do need to really take control of their health and really have those discussions with their healthcare providers so that they know that they're doing what's right for them. I mean, one of the things I always say is that, you know, we're not cookies, so we can't be cookie cutter <laughs> and everything's not a one size fits all solution. It's part of the gift bag I got for being in the, the comedy um, Boulder Comedy Festival, they had a Boulder cookie for the Boulder Cookie Company. Oh. <laughs> and it's just like, it's almond flour and coconut <laughs> oil and, you know, xylitol. Like it's, you know, it's the cookie, the cookie analogies are a bit different in Boulder. Just, just letting you know. Okay. <laughs> so um, one of the things I found that even before jumping into testing, that if people are interested in plant-based diets there there's a there's there's a bigger picture here about a model of health i call the 10 pillars of health mm -hmm. and so uh, you know we're talking about diet which is super important no question no doubt and a lot of people just go like off the deep end only focusing on diet and nothing else mm -hmm. now usually what happens is they go into diet and then they discover all these other things along the way at some point and what I want to do is put all the things up front so that people can have a balanced view of all the different components that go into health. Diet is a massive component of it, but it is certainly not the only. So mm -hmm. just as an example, people can have a perfect diet, but they have terrible sleep. How, I mean, at best, they're just going to plateau at best. Mm -hmm. So I, I created a model that was based off of uh, one, just all my education and, and, and readings and seminars and et cetera. But, the, but most importantly, it was working with real live people, you know, uh, very, very difficult cases. When I in my practice in New Zealand, uh, I was working with like autoimmune, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, hormone imbalance, obese, all usually the same client. Like it was a very, very difficult population that I was working with. Mm. And I found that through detailed history analysis, that they, all the people struggling with chronic issues at a minimum seven out of 10 pillars crumbling, which is why they kept bouncing from one clinician protocol or set of products to the next without sustaining meaningful results is because if, you know, many clinicians are good at really good at one to three pillars, but if someone's got like seven plus that are crumbling, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to get unpredictable or, or at least plateaued results. So uh, you like the best, the best metaphor I've come across is you're sitting on seven tacks and you remove three of them. <laughs> you're technically healthier technic, but do you feel any better? No. And are you fully there? No. Like it's, 
so, so a pain in your in your pain bottom. in the rear. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. I didn't want to say that explicitly. This is a family friendly <laughs> summit, you know. So, um, so there are ten pillars, and in, and and we don't have time to go into all of them in detail. I've got a I've got a free ebook everyone can get at drsamshay.com called a biohack your biohacking. Um, it goes over the ten pillars. I've got other podcasts and and videos on it, but in brief. The 10 pillars are brain and hormones. So hormones would be adrenals, thyroid, uh, xenoestrogen exposure, uh, pillar number, uh, and mitochondria in the brain. Mitochondria is the energy mm-hmm. factories of your brain, of, of your body, and you use like the most in your frontal lobes, your heart and your eyes. Um, and so mitochondrial hormonal health, bowel is digestion, uh, pooping, chewing, how well you absorb food. People ask, what's the best supplement? And I said, Chewing. <laughs> Chewing is the best supplement. That is the best one because you can absorb all the things from food or supplements. Now you don't chew most of your supplements, but the point being, most people don't chew properly. They don't absorb the nutrients they take, whether properly, right. unless it's in, even if it's in food and supplements like organic farmer's market, Portlandia diet, whatever, if they don't have good digestion and absorption, it's kind of going to waste and it can even be kind of productive. So mm-hmm. sometimes people have lots of nutritional deficiencies, which I'll show you in a case study later. One of the main issues is actually their gut needs to be restored first to properly absorb the nutrients. So third pillar is physical body, uh, posture, old injuries, recent injuries, chronic injuries, poor posture, but also genetics. So why is genetics and body? Well, look at identical twins. They have the same bodies because of their genetics. Mm -hmm. So genetic analysis is in the third pillar. Uh, Burst stands for burst exercise. So that's movement. Uh, Sometimes exercise is is a trigger word for people. So I start using the word movement. And so it's quality, duration, intensity, frequency, recovery, the most important thing people miss with a lot of people over exercise. Fifth pillar is biotoxins, a pretty self-explanatory things that hurt you, whether it's heavy metals, petrochemicals, insecticides, pesticides, um, you know, off gassing, whatever it is, bio nutrients is nutrition. It is, it is the positive side of nutri- of, of chemicals. Like what, what are the nutrients that your body uses for healing, health, growth, repair? I include sunlight and oxygen because you literally metabolize those things. Mm. Uh, and breakfast is routines and the starting meal. And I found the sickest people I've ever worked with as a, as a profession were night shift nurses the sickest people as a whole, because their schedules were like this human Tetris that they are put in with their scheduling system, just totally mm. screws them up. And I understand that. I remember <laughs> I um, worked a long time on the midnight shift. And during that time I was working on my master's degree too. So it was going from work to class and not getting much sleep. And yep. yeah, it definitely throws your body out of whack. <laughs> And then you comfort eat with like sugar and coffee and like, in, and, and like mood gets thrown out. Like all, obviously all these pillars intersect. Mm-hmm. And, um, but for teaching purposes, you have to, you know, section them out to, to mm-hmm. splice them apart. Um, yes. And there's some people will be objecting, wait, breakfast. I thought I'm supposed to skip breakfast because intermittent fasting is the best. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of say right up front, like the people that promote intermittent fasting, by skip and skipping breakfast are usually twenties to forties, financially independent tech entrepreneur males. Mm. And, um, you, it's very important to have breakfast, especially if you're female, um, because if you don't eat breakfast, your cortisol levels go up, up and up and which then affects your whole hormone system. Uh, mm. I do believe in intermittent fasting. Absolutely. If you're going to skip something, skip lunch or skip dinner, mm. and, and if it's appropriate for you, you know, there's, there's lots of books out now on fasting, how to do it safely. Uh, I, I believe people should have a solid breakfast. If you want to skip something, skip dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's of course a longer discussion, but I'll just kind of drop that little controversial nugget puddle <laughs> on the, put the codfish in the crocodile pool right now and just kind of let people duke it out. So uh, eighth pillar is bothers, which is stressors of all types. Um, emotional stress, you know, uh, relationship stress, work stress, watching the news is a stressor all on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, clutter, uh, Marie Kondo and in, in the life-changing mm-hmm. magic of tidying up clutter is a legit stress, um, yeah. bugs and hidden infections. So this is gut infections. And I'm not talking about just like the jetting, whatever you get when you're traveling in 
a tropical country, there can be chronic infections. And I've, I've, I can't know how many hundreds and hundreds of gut tests have run in Western countries, first world countries. And there's lots of hidden infections in the gut that, that mm-hmm. don't create anything jutting out of either end. It's that what, what hidden infections do is they eat your nutrients on your behalf, shed toxic inflammatory chemicals, burrow in or gnaw on the organs, you know, like they're, they're problems. Uh, typically we know of common ones like H pylori as one candida as another one, uh, but also mold is in this category as well. Mm. Uh, and uh, people have mold, like you can't win. If you're genetically vulnerable to mold, you cannot win with mold. There's no supplement on the planet. So you got to clean up or move out or do what you need to do to get away from the mold exposure. Tenth pillar is bedtime or sleep, quality, duration, consistency, depth. I have a deep affinity with this pillar because of my history with insomnia. So these are the 10 pillars. And the reason I have them mapped out is that the, the best thing people can do if there is to analyze their 10 pillars and see, okay, what pillar do I need to focus on? Because mm-hmm. what happens with diet sometimes is that they spend 80% of their time on this one pillar to the exclusion of everything else. Yet the main pillars, there's like three other pillars that actually are really require much more attention than diet. Mm. So, so if, and they're all, these all have like equal value, like every pillar, but not all pillars are equal for everybody at every moment in time, but philosophically they all have equal import. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what I encourage people to do is to really understand their lifestyle first. Mm-hmm. And then from there, this is a, this is a busy slide, but uh, basically this is the whole cycle of weight gain and burnout. So you start with lifestyle choices or circumstances, and then your genes influence how you adapt to stressful events in your lifestyle or circumstances. So if you miss a night of sleep, you're doing night shift, you expose to toxic chemicals, you, you, you have an injury, you're not digesting, you're, not, you're, you're constipated for a long term, you're not exercising, you got stress, you got a hidden infection, then you have a, your genetics determine how your body does adaptively responds and the body responds in a combination of one or more of the four main adaptive responses. You either get inflamed, your blood sugar goes off, your tissues begin to degrade, or you generate tons of free radicals. And these are adaptive. So you can survive, you know, Mm -hmm. all these stressors. If you have chronic adaptation, again, the chronic adaptation is interpreted through your genetics. It then harms one or more of your three main organ systems your liver detox system, your gut digestive system, or your brain neuroendocrine brain hormone system. Chronic breakdown of one of one or more of these three systems leads to symptoms like weight gain, fatigue, low mood, indigestion, cravings, insomnia, chronic pain, hot flushes. If you have enough symptoms, you want to cope with bad lifestyle choices, sugar, coffee, skipping exercise, uh, you know, binging on Netflix, whatever, which then leads to more adaptive responses, which leads to more damage, which leads to more symptoms, which leads to more coping, Mm -hmm. coping, adaptation, damage, symptoms, coping, adaptation, damage, cycle, (laughs) it goes around and around. Exactly. So a really good functional clinician does this one, the analyze lifestyle in detail. That's the 10 pillars Two, identify the genetics because the genetics will blockade progression. If you can identify the, the, the genetics that are vulnerable and implement the lifestyle changes that change the expression of those genes to blockade progression, that blockades progression. Then you use functional testing, your hormones now, like your thyroid now, your adrenals now, your mitochondria now, your gut now, your, mito, your, your mitochondria, your liver, your all these. You can identify how you're adapting and what organs are being affected and then customize a lifestyle diet nutrition plan to reverse this entire thing. Looking at the functional level, the genetic level and the lifestyle level. That's the big, big picture. This is basically 20 years of my life on one slide. <laughs> and it's, it's in the book. If people want to study this, um, this is literally 20 years of my life on one slide to understand how the whole thing happens. And then mm-hmm. it's a clinical model of understanding where you can work in each part to bring it back to wholeness. So when you talk about um, how, how the plant-based life diet lifestyle fits into this, what would be kind of your recommendation if someone is, is in that 
or looking to transition to plant-based or they're already plant-based and um, they don't necessarily know which mm -hmm. pillar to start working on. Sure. So the, the first thing to do is to get educated. So how fits, how plant-based you've asked, I think you've, I think I heard was two questions. It was like, how do they know what pillar to start on and how do they incorporate plant-based into Correct. Into that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I did mix, <laughs> mix so, questions. So with. to answer, so to answer plant-based, so there's a question of there, there's a spectrum of plant-basedness. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, plant-based is a moving target. So are people plant exclusive, meaning they're vegan, or mm -hmm. are they plant emphasized? And also are they plant clean? Mm -hmm. So plant clean. So I'll give you a great resource right away. If people want to start on plant-based diet, ewg.org and look at the dirty dozen and the clean yeah. 15 environmental mm -hmm. working group, ewg.org. So one of the things that I tell my clients is who are some clients are like, I don't have time to go to the farmer's market every week. Uh, I, I don't whole foods is far away. I don't want to buy all super expensive uh, organic vegetables. My risk, my compromise is the following says, okay, here's a list of the dirty dozen, the top mm -hmm. 12 most heavily sprayed produce items in mm -hmm. the United States. Those 12 are required to be organic or bust. And if it's an 80, 20 analysis, you remove the 20% most toxic produce items, you eliminate 80% of the pesticide exposure. The, the, I don't have the exact numbers, but you get the point. Like mm -hmm. the top 12, dirty dozen, only those, if you just do those 12, I'm happy the rest are negotiable. Done. <laughs> Great. Right. Okay. So, and again, that's part of that practicality thing we talked about in the beginning. You don't make it right. too hard. Make, you know, give, give people easy wins. Dirty dozen, neutral third party, told, researched, updated every single year wonderful beautiful graphic these little cards you know you can yeah. digital things great you know easy win uh so that's plant clean then there's plant emphasized like and no i don't count potato chips as a plant or ketchup as a vegetable <laughs> sorry reagan like the ketchup is not a vegetable in my book okay do you know that story that he in order did you hear about that story of reagan and ketchup and vegetable servings uh no i did not okay this is real <laughs> this this is real in order, in order to include something like to account for like the, I was, uh, oh God, it's been a while, but it's, it's something to the effect of in order for the FDA to claim that Americans on average children had so many servings of vegetables, they had to include ketchup as a vegetable just to raise the number of servings of vegetables. Wow. It was in the Reagan administration and like it was somewhere back then. So it's like, uh, that that's real. That's that's worth looking up. To what is the definition of plant based? Is ketchup plant based? Well, mm. kinda, sorta, maybe you know. Um. So they, I would start with plant clean, mm -hmm. and then plant emphasized, meaning that look at the food you're eating. How much of it? How much of the food you're eating has a wrapper on it that lists more than one ingredient? Mm. So if it's got more than one ingredient, chances are it's not food, but it's a food product or food-like product. Mm. So if people are looking for sweets, I have a sweet tooth, I understand, I overcame a sugar addiction, I'm totally sympathetic to this. Uh, one thing that you can do is really search out what are these sweet tasting vegetables that help swap in and substitute. Like, for example, certain carrots, like baby carrots. Oh, hello. Ba baby carrot. Look, first up, my little my little Frenchie, my uh, Lily. Mm -hmm. She'll do anything for baby carrot. She I've never seen a bulldog <laughs> like lose her little mind when she sees a baby carrot. Like, and baby carrots can be the replacement for lots of people's sugar cravings. The same mm -hmm. thing with sweet peas. Like it's sweet pea season right now here in mm -hmm. Colorado, and yeah. I feel vaguely guilty like eating that many <laughs> sweet peas. Like. like I'm getting my vegetables. Like it's, I'm not, I'm kind of questioning my <laughs> motives there anyway. So like you, you can, you can swap mm -hmm. things that have more than one ingredient to things with one ingredient, a mm -hmm. carrot, a sweet pea. Um, be careful of fruit. Um, certain fruits, people can like, especially dried fruit, dried fruit can just be so densely concentrated sugar that, and you can like eat like a, like, what is it like a, 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 a an apricot is it's a dried nectarine or dried peach, right? I'm 
one of the two, something like that. Yeah, I think it's a dried nectarine. Dried nectarine, yeah. Uh, so, so could you, if people can sit there and eat like 10, 10 halves, yeah. you know, 10, 10 apples, but that's the equivalent sugar of five full nectarines you just ate in like two minutes. Would you ever eat five of those that quick? Like, so you can get really concentrated sugar that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to do, um, if you're going to look at the pillars uh, in terms of plant-based is, is to look also at timing of when you eat. So this is the breakfast and routines. Mm -hmm. So eating at, you know, 1130 at night, but you're eating all vegan, but you know, vegetables is not, I, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, cause that's going to interfere with your sleep. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of peripheral things that you can do to help one incorporate more plants into the diet. I am personally do not endorse veganism except for short-term detox things under supervision, unless you've got a whole bunch of other things that have lined up. The people that I see really, really succeed in veganism are, uh, Kafa body, like bigger body type retired men mm -hmm. and because they've, they've got, they've, they've got kind of the constitution. Uh, and because I've seen so many times and I'll show some examples of people that just based on lab testing and also just, you know, what they're physically going through, just fail, just, just mm -hmm. do not thrive. I tried to be vegan you know, I had all, all organic, all the, everything you can, everything do. And I was like wasting away. I had mm -hmm. friends of mine that were instructors in the vegan movement that she developed Hashimoto's and he started losing all of his hair. She started losing her teeth. Um, the, the wife of the guy who did supersize me. Um, oh my God. I can't believe I'm blanking on her name. Um, oh my God. I'm so embarrassed. She, she was, she was a very famous traveling vegan for 10 years and she went public that she's no longer vegan because her health was just collapsing. And I've seen other people who do well, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. And, but the, but then things become problematic. And the reason why things come problematic is that if you imagine, I'll just, um, I'll stop. People think it's problematic because when people, animal-based nutrients stay in the body for a while, a couple mm -hmm. of years, plant-based nutrients are quick. They're in and out. And so there's three columns, plant-based nutrients, uh, animal-based nutrients, and then um, toxins. So when someone switches to an all-plant-based diet, their uh, toxin levels, assuming it's like, you know, farmer's market, clean vegetables, their toxin levels go down, their plant nutrients go up, but their animal-based nutrients slowly go down over a period of about two to five years. So there's this two-year honeymoon period with diehard vegans where they're feeling great, all this energy, all these things clear up, et cetera, et cetera. And, but then things, you know, two, maybe five years, like then things start to go downhill and they keep going downhill. But by that time, they've changed their friends, their social circles, they're, they're selling coconut oil and, and writing cookbooks and on the blogosphere. And, and so like, there's this huge social sunk cost where their entire life has been enveloped by uh, the vegan movement. And there's a huge pressure. I mean, the, 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 I mean, you can just read the, the, I can't believe I'm blanking on her name. I'm so embarrassed. Um, she, she got just, just like called traitor. Like it's just absolutely harassed and, and just attacked viciously, um, by the vegan community for being a failure or being weak or, or, Uh-oh, you froze. I'm having some technical difficulties. Hopefully we'll get you back quickly. Okay, okay, there you are. You froze there for a moment. <laughs> I think my 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 internet went on holiday. All right, so it's actually the 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 uh, person is Alex Jameson. Okay, uh, want to look up her story, Alex Jameson, and so 
Uh, and I just wanted to make this really real because I, we can talk about theoreticals of like people when we talk about, I have a talk I called um, ending the food war, finding peace and common ground between vegans and paleos. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I opened the, this is like a two hour talk that I gave to 400 people in the South Island of New Zealand with some real diehard vegans that come out of the woodwork there for that festival. And I talk about the open with the first half hour is the 11 meta narratives people are arguing about. It's not broccoli versus beef. That's not what they're arguing about. They're arguing about politics, environment, uh, the, the future, religion, personal preference, uh, food accessibility, you know, water usage. Like they're, they're fighting about all sorts of different narratives. It's, and it's emblematic. It's, it, it's kind of idolizing the broccoli versus beef argument. Mm. And, and, and so when I, when I, I talk about opening, look, we're not fighting over these things. We're fighting over these meta narratives. And then I talk about here are the good intentions of the vegan movement. Here are the good intentions of the paleo movement. Here's where there's problems in both sides. And then here's where we agree on, which is basically 90% of everything mm -hmm. local, clean, you know, uh, seasonal, like, uh, not minimal carbon footprint, all these other things. And it's just like, there's these last 10% that people are actually arguing over. And uh, where people, and when we're talking about testing to just to show um, like what, what is actually going on when I've actually tested people who are, you know, vegans or near vegans, I'll just give you one example. So just the, the testing that I do you know, includes like there's hormone testing, such as like adrenal testing, Dutch hormones, checking sex hormones and melatonin on top of adrenal stress. Thyroid is really important. There's different types of gut testing uh, for hidden infections, uh, digestion markers, immune system, uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, infections, food insensitivities. And then there's mitochondrial brain and liver testing. This is urine and this advanced version is liver and sorry, is urine and blood. And this checks for amongst other things like the key amino acids and fat soluble vitamins. And people talk about, well, if I go plant-based then I'm gonna have all the amino acids if I combine. It's like, really, are you sure? Because when you actually look at these, this is, I know it's kind of small print. I can kind of zoom in a little bit, but I'm just gonna zoom in Okay, this is a quintile distribution. This is a bell curve. So this is, this is a client who is effectively a vegan. And first quintile is really bad. So just see how many things, and this is even below the first quintile. This is in the bottom 2.5% of the population. How many things are low? Okay. And so that this is a real, this is a real client who thought she was eating super healthy and all the rest of it, but she came to me, you know, very unwell. Uh, and then here is example of the same person here, are her fat soluble vitamins low in the bottom 2.5% of CoQ10. Uh, when it's, when it's in this L, then you've got vitamin A different, uh, sorry, there's vitamin E different type of vitamin E retinol, her lipid peroxides, this is how much fat is being, uh, when fat hits her body, it basically becomes uh, free radical damage. It's like her body is frying it. There's another free radical damage marker. And this is really low vitamin D. I want vitamin D to be at least 60 to 80. Mm. And then here's all her essential fatty acids, the omega-3s and the omega-6s. Like they're just tragically low, tragically low. And this is a person who was committed to eating organic, vegan, et cetera, for years or near vegan. And if people are going to do really plant exclusive or near plant exclusive diets, they have to get testing. Like to me, that's not negotiable. They have to get testing to see, are you getting the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acids, the fatty acids that you're actually needing? Because if if you're relying on population-based statistics of like, well, such and if you combine this thing with this thing, then you should have this amino acid problem. Well, yeah, that's what you should have, but your body may metabolize things differently. You may absorb things differently and you are not, you are not a bell curve. Mm. <laughs> you are not a bell curve, you know? So get, get the testing. Mm -hmm. And there's even genetics testing. I'll just zoom. There's even genetics testing to determine like 
what your trigger foods can be, your relationship to dairy, your relationship to gluten, your relationship to caffeine, to alcohol, to histamines, to salt, to other food allergens. Then there's finding out your, your diet genetically in terms of the nutrients that you may need more of. Like I need way more fish oil than other people because my genetics are so pro-inflammatory. Now, for some people, if they're so pro-inflammatory, they gain a lot of weight. But for me, it's, I get a lot of pain. Mm. And so I didn't know that I needed much higher doses of a particular nutrient until I actually ran my genetics. I didn't really, you know, for the, uh, I didn't realize that I, um, my diet, you know, there's a, this is how you determine if you're a keto, a paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb. There's a special uh, genetics test. It's not something you get from 23andMe or Ancestry because it's not looking at variations of a gene, it's looking at duplicates of a gene. Mm. And it's the gene that breaks down carbohydrates. And if you're a low number, which I am, I'm a two, that means that me and carbs don't get along. So I had the most perfect Mediterranean Portlandia diet you can imagine, knew the names of my farmers, you know, effectively the chickens or whatever. And it didn't matter how organic and sprouted the quinoa was, it wasn't a quality issue, it was a quantity issue. So within one week of changing my diet to my actual carb tolerance, 20 years of digestive problems went away. Mm. One week, wow. one week. So you can genetically determine your optimal diet. And if people are concerned about weight, you know, there's three genetic based weight gainers. The people who are inflammatory water weight gainers, hormonal toxic weight gainers, or calorie fat weight gainers. This is the least common that I see. Most people are inflammatory water weight gainers. Mm -hmm. The typical is that when people, you know, they eat a little muffin, whatever or a grain thing, and they just blow up by one to two pounds, maybe three pounds in a day. It's not unless that muffin was last year's regifted Christmas fruitcake, it didn't weigh three pounds. But what happened is it triggered an inflammatory cascade in your body that was propagated genetically. And your body retained all this water to dilute all the toxic inflammatory chemicals to do what? Buy the liver and kidneys time to filter the toxic chemicals out. Mm. That's why you can blow up, swell up from a tiny little thing. It's an inflammatory response. And just to put a fine point on it with weight, this is a federal government report in May 2009 and obesity in Australia, one of the fattest countries on the planet. 70% of people's weight is genetics. 70%. So if you want to know what type of weight you're carrying, you can get genetically tested and look for clusters. Like this is an inflammatory cluster client. And then this is hormonal detox. Like they've got problems detoxing estrogens and other things in their liver. This is a cascade. You've got estrogen affected fat creates belly fat, which increases inflammation, which then doses the, the fat that's got us. And this is, you get this kind of round and round. This is from an interview I did with Dr. Beaver. That's on, on the website. Mm -hmm. So genetics is also another avenue for lab testing. There's the functional testing, you know, the adrenals, the gut, mitochondria, et cetera. Then there's genetics. The two of them go best hand in hand, but they can be done separately. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty much the summary of how, if you're going to do, if you're going to do plant-based, go plant clean, a la environmental working group. Mm -hmm swap out foods that have more than one ingredient for plants like carrots and sweet peas, whatever. Um, make, look at the 10 pillars. If you want to start somewhere, start with the most common pillars people should start with is their breakfast and routines. They should start with their bowel, making sure they're chewing and cooing properly. They should have, um, they should have a really good look at their sleep. Uh, that's one of the biggest accelerants of people's health. And then lastly, it, it's telling people to look at their stress can be a big thing for people like, cause it's, it's such a big thing, but it can be one of the most influential for people's initial gains to mm -hmm. feel better. And then look at testing, look at the different types of testing. And, you know, this is, this is real, like the deficiencies are, are a real threat. And so if you're going to go plant-based, like, and really plant-based, get testing, and then you can know exactly what you need to do to mitigate deficiencies. Um, and if people want to contact me, I've got my website, drsamshay.com forward slash contact. At the time of this recording, I'm doing free 15 minute health strategy calls. 
And also my website, I've got two eBooks, one on the genetics and one on the 10 pillars. So people can download both for free if they want much more detail. Well, that's great. Thank you. And um, everyone, when you receive the, the link for this interview, you also get the link that uh, Dr. Shea is providing for his uh, biohack, your biohacking, 10 pillars of health. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Shea. I know that you um, are a busy man and I really appreciate you taking the time out to provide this uh, great information. Do you have resources on your site as well if someone is looking to try to find a functional medicine practitioner? Uh, so the only person on my site is, is me. Um, well. <laughs> if people want, so I, so uh, I, I, you know, I, I've been doing telemed for over three years before okay. it was fashionable. Um, if people are looking for other uh, practitioners, um, then there's two websites that they can go to ifm.org or kalishinstitute.org or .com. I can't remember which, which, which one is which. I'm, I'm a certified practitioner with both those organizations. And okay. uh, that's where you're going to find practitioners who do have lots of extra training in functional medicine. Okay. Well, thank you again. I appreciate your time with this interview. And thank you all for joining us today for the plant-based fat loss solution series, where you are bringing, um, all the experts are bringing us wonderful information so you can make informed choices for your best optimal health. We will see you at the next interview. Thank you, Tanya. Bye.